Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs Daily War Room Update. We are on day 54 of the war with Gaza and the terrorists in Gaza. It started on the 7th of October with the massacre of over 1,200 people and the taking of over 235, 239 to be exact hostages um, by the terrorists in Gaza. Um, we've been going into a period of a halt, a seize, a, uh, uh, in, the, in the fighting on the ground for the last uh, uh, five days in order to facilitate the release of some of the hostages. And indeed, over the last uh, four days, we've seen 50 hostages being released in uh, uh, return for the release of 150 terrorists from Israeli prisons. Um, that has been a process uh, that has carried on over a, a number of days, each day 13 hostages being released and 39 terrorists being released. And there have been also a number of additional hostages released as a, um, as a marks of goodwill um, by the terrorists in Gaza to the Thai government that apparently threatened them with uh, um, the execution of uh, terrorists in their prisons if they didn't release the hostages and with at least one hostage as a as a gift of goodwill to a, a Russian uh, um, President uh, Putin. Um, that's what we're seeing over the last few days. There are continuing discussions as to how the halt in the fighting can be extended for a number of days. Um, at the moment, not exactly clear how long that will be. The original decision by the Israeli government was to approve a halt of, of the fighting for up to 10 days only, um, after which um, the fighting would resume and the efforts to uh, really destroy Hamas, its uh, terrorist infrastructure, and its uh, potential um, to continue governing um, the Gaza Strip. So that's what we're seeing at the, at the moment. Um, on our northern fronts, as we've uh, um, uh, traditionally updated, there seems to be a little bit of a quiet at the moment, also following the same um, up there. It's more of a ceasefire than it is a halt, um, as it is in Gaza, um, with uh, no more rockets being fired by Hezbollah, no more uh, uh, um, anti-tank missiles um, being fired at the Israeli soldiers or civilians on our northern border. In Judea and Samaria, things are still extremely, extremely uh, uh, sensitive um, and volatile. We've seen a number of uh, um, uh, attempts or a rising number of attempts to carry out more and more terror attacks from Judea and Samaria and the response of the IDF arresting over 2,000 um, terrorists in the last 54 days as well, most of them connected with uh, uh, Hamas. And just this morning, we saw more operations going on in Jenin in uh, the northern Samaria um, in order to counter the terrorist threats that were posed there. Um, on, on the side of the Israeli Arab population, um, which has always been part of the equation, we've seen a continuing of the calm. There were some uh, uh, concerns that possibly the release of terrorists, um, Israeli Arab terrorists, as part of this deal with Hamas, would possibly uh, diversely affect uh, uh, um, uh, um, what's going on in the Israeli Arab population. But at the moment, we're seeing um, quite uh, uh, um, that continued quiet um, continuing on. Um, so those are the updates from the different uh, um, areas. Nothing more from the Houthis um, far off. Uh, um, as, as we updated yesterday, there's been another seizure of another boat that they're claiming and, and, and the freeing of a boat by American forces, but no more missiles or rockets or UAVs um, being fired by them in Israel's direction. Um, so what we're going to discuss today um, with my uh, esteemed guest and friend, uh, Brigadier General in the Reserves, uh, Yossi Kupavasa, um, is, 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 is really the, the whole idea of the intelligence uh, um, challenges surrounding the, the war in Gaza. Um, how do we gather intelligence? How do we keep on gathering in intelligence? Um, the traditional forms of, uh, of, of intelligence that we've seen, whether it be informants, whether it be uh, um, technological capabilities, whether it be uh, um, really conducting uh, um, interrogations of terrorists on the ground whilst in Gaza and also um, further uh, uh, away from home or away from Gaza um, by um, uh, uh, continued interrogations of terrorists who have been arrested there um, by the Israel intelligence agency, uh, the Shin Bet. Um, 
you know, see, walk us through those different ideas of of what we have, what we could possibly do, how the the possibly the ceasefire has diversely affected uh, affected our our intelligence capabilities, if at all. Um, what what is your sense of 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 where we're holding there? Well, first of all, it's great to be again with you. Uh, what we are doing right now, and when we talk about intelligence in this war, we have actually two chapters. One is everything that relates to the intelligence before the war started and the failure of the intelligence. And there's a lot of information coming out uh, about what happened before and what kind of information was available to the Israeli intelligence at the time and why the intelligence ignored the uh, signs that were raised and uh, actually could have understood that uh, such an attack is uh, is in the planning and uh, never took the necessary precautions in order to be prepared for such an attack so this is an, one story that we might we may uh, discuss in, in more length but the the point is that uh, once this was behind us and we entered the war itself the challenges of the intelligence became much more uh, demanding uh, on so many fronts that we fight on simultaneously and uh, with many more people than what we have in the intelligence in regular days, in ordinary days, because many reservists joined in and, uh, and many volunteers came from all over the country in order to uh, back the intelligence effort of the system itself with uh, their capabilities to employ state-of-the-art technologies uh, for providing intelligence uh, from without the, the intelligence community. So we are in a, in a very peculiar situation and uh, it's worth uh, studying it and uh, seeing what lessons can be learned about how the intelligence should be prepared for such uh, situations. Well, coming back to what you were talking about, the challenges that we have now, uh, specifically in Gaza, are uh, immense. And we, are, we have to collect the information in, in new ways uh, that uh, we were not used to for, for quite a while. First of all, we have to uh, be very focused on intelligence about the uh, hostages. That's a new element that uh, nobody would uh, imagine that we would have at one point uh, close to 240 uh, hostages in the hands of Hamas and being able to, first of all, to know who is, who is there and uh, who took them and what is their condition and where are they kept. And uh, to what extent can we rely on Hamas to, to be able to uh, bring them back? And uh, what is the logic of uh, the uh, capturing of, the, of those uh, hostages? And uh, what is the reasonable price that we were uh, be demanded to, to pay for their release? And uh, there are so many questions that uh, uh, are about this issue of the hostages that the intelligence has to come up with uh, answers to. Not easy. Uh, especially as there was no structure that would uh, focus on this uh, matter and that uh, bringing the answers requires a big effort that's coming at the end of the day and the expense of other efforts that uh, should be exerted in order to uh, support the fighting forces. But somehow we managed to uh, do what's necessary for that purpose. We were not able until now, with one exception, uh, to carry out uh, operations for the release of the uh, hostages based on the intelligence. The, but we have, I guess, a lot of information and we keep gathering information. Secondly, much of the information we get for the purpose of supporting the fighting forces is coming from close air uh, reconnaissance. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one of it's no surprise that one of the conditions of the Hamas for having disposed in the in the fight in the fighting as, uh, as we know it was the that Israel will uh, commit to not using uh, UAVs for uh, intelligence reconnaissance uh, during uh, most of the pose both in southern Gaza and uh, some of the parts of the day in northern Gaza as well uh, they have a clear uh, logic behind it uh, which makes sense let's say if you cover this area so closely, we should not be able to locate the uh, and get to the uh, to the hostages in order to release them because you might know where we were keeping them, and uh, this is something that we cannot compromise on. 
So uh, we accepted this uh, condition and uh, we are paying a price, of course, because we can uh, we cannot collect collect information through this uh, facility. And uh, it's not that we that it is the end of the day in the end of the world. We have other means, but uh, this was uh, definitely something that, as we say, we we have one one hand tied tied behind our back when it comes to intelligence collection. We are, uh, though, uh, getting, I guess, some advantage of the products from what you mentioned, Maurice, the uh, use of uh, our ability to get to sources of intelligence that were far away from us uh, without the ground incursion, both uh, uh, reaching all kinds of uh, uh, technical information that uh, is necessary for improving the intelligence by getting to the command posts of the Hamas in, in various way, various areas, including under the Shifa hospital, and uh, but in many other places, and uh, by uh, collecting information from their headquarters, uh, we reached already so many headquarters. In each one of them, we found uh, all kinds of inf information that we collected and uh, processed and uh, extracted information from that is critical for the conduction, uh, for the conduct of the war. Uh, and secondly, from interrogating the uh, captives, we have many captives, uh, the number was not uh, released so far, but I can say that we have many captives that uh, we took while we were running those uh, operations and uh, from interrogating them, uh, I can tell you that uh, a lot of uh, very important information was extracted and uh, used in order to safeguard our soldiers and to in order to uh, make sure that uh, the operation goes more smoothly than it should than it could have without this kind of information. Uh, of course, it's, this information is also important for uh, exposing the real nature of Hamas, how they use. Uh, uh, civilian facilities for uh, military purposes, for terroristic purposes. And uh, this is also something that is uh, coming both from the captives and from the fact that we reach those places when you find uh, uh, missiles in the uh, crib of a baby, uh, it helps you make the point. And uh, we have to understand that uh, there's a big effort here uh, regarding the fight over the uh, the way the international community looks at what happens. The, one of the main goals here is to make sure that the international community understands what kind of uh, people we fight against, not only uh, based on what they did on the 7th of October, but also on the way they use uh, their own population as human shields uh, in order to protect themselves from uh, Israeli attacks. So all of that is uh, part of the intelligence. Of course, we keep using the, all, the usual stuff uh, we are trying to uh, intercept uh, whatever we can out of their communications. We are uh, using our uh, visual intelligence uh, as much as we can. We have improved our uh, human intelligence. Human sources are now uh, used more than before. We have employed uh, our uh, human source unit, the uh, five, 504 unit of the military, is uh, focused on uh, collecting human intelligence in Gaza. They were this shop was closed uh, many years ago, and uh, the entire uh, effort for collecting uh, information from human sources in Gaza was in the hand of the ISA, of the Israeli uh, Security Agency. Uh, now uh, the army is also uh, a part of this effort, and uh, we uh, collect in valuable information from their activities as well. Uh, this is uh, this is the effort we conduct now in Gaza in order to support the forces and uh, make sure that uh, they have the, the necessary information. The outcome of that, beyond the successful um, uh, ground incursion, is the production of targets. In the uh, throughout the, the war, we have produced uh, more than fifteen thousand targets uh, that were delivered to the air force and to the artillery in order to hit them. And uh, amazingly, uh, there was no claim that any of those targets was, was the wrong target. When you produce 15,000 targets, you would imagine that uh, you may make one mistake or two or three or four. 
uh, but uh, amazingly, the, even the Hamas didn't claim that any of these targets was the wrong target. Uh, there was one claim by Hamas that we chose the wrong, the wrong target. This was the very famous story of uh, the hospital uh, Ali al-Mahmadani. Uh, but of course, it, it, turns out, it turned out that this was, uh, this was not Israel that attacked it. It was not the, the hospital that was hit, but uh, the parking area. And uh, and there was no 500 casualties, but uh, something around dozens of uh, casualties were hit. But it was uh, done by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and not us. And uh, an amazing stuff about that is that uh, recently, even the Human Rights Watch, was, uh, which you cannot uh, suspect for being uh, pro-Israeli, uh, came out with the conclusion that yes, this was Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and not the Israelis who hit this uh, target. So on top of that. 15,000 targets were all correct targets, which tells you in an in a environment like that to produce a target, it's very difficult because the life longevity of a target here is very short. You have to produce the target and uh, deliver it to the uh, fi fire uh, un unit that is going to take care of it uh, within a very short period of time. And uh, we did it uh, very successfully. We managed to... Uh, eliminate something, more than 5,000 uh, uh, Hamas uh, militants, uh, Hamas terrorists uh, during the fight. And this is a major achievement of the, that uh, to a large extent is based on the intelligence provided by the intelligence community, both uh, the ISA and the military intelligence, especially the military the intelligence of the uh, Southern Command and the uh, local uh, Gaza division. Uh, that produce most of these uh, targets, so uh, it's it's a major uh, uh, effort for the for the intelligence to to provide all the kinds of intelligence that are necessary, and of course also intelligence on the on the strategic level. What is Hezbollah going to do? What is uh, going uh, inside the mind of Sinwar as we speak? And what is his plan? Can we? what needs to be done and what are the circumstances under which we can expect Sinwar, if, it, if ever, to surrender uh, or to be ready to, to make an exchange of uh, hostages that is going to be uh, acceptable for Israel. And uh, many, many strategic uh, and, uh, questions are raised as well. So this is on, on the ongoing fighting, the intelligence in the ongoing fighting. And it's a very impressive effort. and. Uh, and the ability to provide all this and uh, produce all this information and all, this, all of this intelligence after the debacle of uh, October 7th uh, is, is uh, something impressive because the, the people that were uh, that are leading this effort are the same people that were uh, responsible for the failure. And they managed to, to put this, uh, this feeling of uh, shame and, and uh, responsibility behind them and the focus on. on doing what needs to be done right now, because we don't have two intelligences, one for, for this purpose and one for the other purpose. It's the same people that have to uh, lead this effort and, uh, and in a very impressive way, they, they did it. So really That's on that it. point... Sorry, yes, please, Moise. So, so really on that point, Yossi, I'd like to uh, just intervene and, and, and really try and make that uh, um, differentiation between the intelligence before the start of the war and the intelligence that has come afterwards and as a result of the actions of our force on the ground. Before the war, we have, I think, two different categories of, of, of discussion, I, I would suggest. One category is how Israel really quite uh, um, extensively mapped out the terrorist capabilities of Hamas, um, of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, of the other terrorist groups in the Gaza Strip so that on any given day, we would be able to respond and respond with force, as we did uh, um, immediately after the, the October 7 massacre, and, and really target, as you said, 15,000 targets hit. They are what's called and, and, and commonly known, at least in, in Israeli jargon, as, as Banka Matarot, the, the, the bank of different targets that are built up during, during the times of quiet rather than uh, um, during the war, and and then so that when any uh, um, event happens, we are ready to respond. So that I think, I, I I would assume you would agree that the 
that the success of the IDF intelligence was to gather those targets, make sure that we knew where, where the terrorists live, where they were operating from, where uh, they were keeping their rocket launchers, and so we could immediately attack that terrorist infrastructure. That's on the one hand. On the, on the other hand, clearly, the, as, you, as you described it uh, uh, so accurately, accurately, the debacle of, of the 7th of October itself and how we didn't see um, that event coming and, uh, uh, and, and, and clearly uh, um, prepare ourselves for it, as we uh, uh, possibly did in 2018. In 2018, there were similar attempts to, to breach en masse um, the border, but, but the IDF was really prepared uh, um, to a much greater extent. How would you uh, uh, possibly uh, um, differentiate between those two, uh, uh, on one hand, the great success of preparing for the war, and on the other hand, and identifying the targets, and on the other hand, um, not identifying the clear uh, um, statements of, of Hamas and its military uh, <laughs> operations just prior to the war and understanding them as a, as a real intention to, to carry out the massacre. Well, first of all, just one correction. The, the, the Target's bank uh, was depleted a uh, long time ago, I think. The, many of the 15,000 targets are targets that were produced during the war. It's uh, moving targets and uh, uh, targets that uh, emerged during the war and they were need, there was a need to produce them, so to turn them into targets while the war was uh, fought. And But part of it was the... the uh, targets uh, bank that uh, was also taken care of. Uh, and yes, this is a, these are two different uh, kinds of intelligence. And I must say uh, that in recent years, the intelligence moved uh, since I was there a long time ago, uh, moved uh, much more to the producers of targets uh, banks. And uh, dealt less with uh, with strategic intelligence and with trying to understand better the logic of the enemy. Not that they didn't do it; of course they did, but uh, this was less and less uh, the focus of the intelligence. And uh, definitely, what happened here there was a conception, a prior concept of about what where is the the mind of uh, Hamas, that uh, the leadership of the intelligence and maybe many other people inside the intelligence believe that this is the case that the Hamas was uh, focusing, because Hamas, because we dealt with Hamas in 2018 and 2019, because we closed the option for Hamas to carry out the wide-scale attack through the bo through the tunnels that were crossing into Israel, uh, because we found a relatively good answer to the rockets that Hamas was producing with the Iron Dome and other uh, anti-missile weaponry that we have developed, there was this uh, feeling that, uh, well, what Hamas, what can Hamas do now? It's uh, they are they don't have the option of uh, producing a replacement, a substitute for the lo the capabilities they lost. So they focus now on improving the living conditions of the people in Gaza. Uh, they uh, try to improve their own conditions, and uh, but they are deterred from. Uh, Opening a new war, definitely wide scale is the one we we saw now, and uh, that's why we shouldn't worry about Hamas. And once and since we just gave him, gave Hamas uh, eighteen thousand permits for workers from Gaza to work in Israel, and uh, allowed them to get the money from Qatar, uh, they are definitely not uh, inclined to to embark on uh, such a wide scale and uh, vicious attack uh, that they carried out, and uh, and. Even though to, in some circles in intelligence, there was awareness that such a plan exists and that uh, Hamas does make ex exercises in order to be better prepared and trained to carry out this attack, uh, nobody thought that the time is now, the, the days preceding uh, October 7th, and many people were didn't have this plan as something real. They saw that Hamas is playing with this uh, idea, but didn't think that this is something that should be uh, should be keep, keeping them awake at night. And uh, when they uh, discussed this uh, 
weak signs that they got on the night of six, uh, the, between the 6th and 7th of October uh, that indicated that something is cooking, their immediate reaction was not, oh, that reminds me of this plan that we were talking about. And uh, we should, uh, because of that, take all kinds of measures that, that uh, are relevant to, to such a wide scale plan. And, uh, and when the women observers uh, along the border came to their commanders and uh, said, uh, look, something fishy is, is happening, uh, they were dismissed and, uh, and warned not to bother the <laughs> higher echelons uh, with this nonsense. And uh, when the uh, lady uh, uh, from uh, Unit A200 uh, came up and uh, said, uh, look, uh, this uh, I'm, I'm worried that something is happening in, in Hamas and they are planning this plan and they mean it and they, they might carry it out and it's going to be uh, something huge. Uh, people tell, told her, uh, come on, this, this is just fun. This is a fantasy. They cannot do it. It's... Uh, because we were so so deeply caught by this uh, conception of uh, what Hamas wants and what Hamas can can do. Now it, it wasn't that we were not aware of the capabilities that were developed over there. We all knew about the Toyotas and about the, uh, the exercises. I mean, we the intelligence. Well, you're describing about, what you're uh, describing you know, yourself almost is almost a, a repeat event of 1973. We understand that our enemy has has capabilities. We understand that they have. And, and they're expressing rhetoric um, to attack, but we completely ignore it, believing that we are in a position where they are deterred from actually carrying out that type of attack. Uh, 50 years later, almost exactly to the day, it appears that we fell into that same, uh, that same misconception. Yes, and uh, the reason for, for that is that basically, this is human nature. We want to believe what we believe in. And we we pay much more attention to those signs that uh, make us uh, strengthen our belief in in what we believe in. And when there is a sign that uh, there are indicators that uh, put uh, question marks about what we believe in, we tend to underestimate their importance. That's and when you're stuck uh, in that Oslo well conception, that, and when you're stuck in that Oslo conception of we have uh, the ability to uh, um, deter slash pay off slash buy off. Um, Enemies who uh, um, who clearly state in their charters, in their daily lives, that uh, we have our intention to destroy Israel, then that brings us into that whole idea of, well, that there is something that we can pay them uh, a higher fee, a lesser fee, um, in order to um, into in order to buy them off and deter them from from uh, um, obviously from trying to implement their uh, uh, homicidal uh, idea of destroying Israel. Um, that's something. The point, which the point I, is that. This is this is a cement that uh, is making this uh, conception so rigid, so un uh, un unable for people, uh, the inability of people to change it, because of this uh, exactly uh, the argument you made. But you know the the, the intelligence did develop all kinds of uh, tools that were supposed to to overcome this problem. We we know that there is this problem in intelligence, so we developed these tools after the Yom Kippur War that were supposed to mitigate the problem and uh, unfortunately in this case uh, one of these uh, actually none of these tools were uh, effective uh, one of them was used to some extent but uh, the other two were totally uh, unhelpful we we have the uh, devil's advocate that is uh, supposed to come up with a op op opposite uh, concept to uh, conception on, on each issue and that they were supposed to say, no, Hamas is not deterred. Hamas is uh, planning to carry out an attack. We should be on alert and so on. So forth. they didn't, nobody, if, if they did say it, nobody paid attention. Uh, and maybe they didn't say it. I don't know. But one thing is clear. That they did. They were not effective. The second problem is that uh, we developed the idea of pluralism. Many uh, bodies will be responsible for assessment. Not only one body, as, there was, the case, as was the case in 73. So the ISA was supposed to, to come up with their assessment. The uh, Southern Command was supposed to come up with their assessment. The division, uh, the Gaza Division Intelligence was supposed to come up with their assessment. And of course, the uh, military intelligence uh, in, the, in the headquarters was supposed to come with their, with their assessment as well. All of them, 
dismissed the option of a uh, huge terror attack on, uh, at this point of time. And uh, all of them were caught uh, by this conception and didn't provide any any benefit from the fact that uh, we have several sources that would uh, produce assessment. And thirdly, we had this uh, system that called a different opinion, that, so that every officer can come up with a different opinion. Uh, and on that issue, there was one lady and maybe two two ladies in uh, Unit uh, A200, famous uh, uh, interception unit, that uh, said, uh, "Look, something is cooking." But she she stopped short at uh, having an exchange with one of the so the officers, high-ranking officer that was uh, involved in that, and she didn't turn it into a, what we call a paper of different opinion. She could have. I don't know if she she was aware of the of the fact that she can or she or she wasn't, but anyhow she could have uh, uh, turned it into a official uh, different opinion, and uh, I can tell you as somebody who wrote maybe the most important uh, different opinion in the in the military in in my days in the in the intelligence uh, that went all the way up to the minister of defense and uh, was accepted and and was preferred on the. Uh, prevailing opinion that was uh, there at, at, at the time uh, that once you do that it, it requires the uh, all echelons to 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 discuss this uh, different opinion and uh, there is a chance for you to to uh, make sure that everybody is aware of this different opinion maybe even take it as, as the opinion uh, and in this case this could have happened or not I don't know but uh, could have wouldn't necessarily do that and uh, this didn't happen in, in this case, although she did raise uh, her concerns. The, the most, uh, even more interesting story that uh, is being told now is that the uh, division intelligence or the division, the, the Gaza division, came up with a, with an understanding about what's uh, what's to be expected from Hamas, following all the practices and training that they were conducting, and. In April 22 and in August 23, just two months before the before the attack, they presented this uh, option in a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, and still this just went through one ear and went out from the other ear, and uh, nobody turned that into something that uh, you need to prepare to, and uh, even on the day and the and the night that I, as I mentioned before, even on the night where the operation. When, the Hamas operation was uh, cooking and pre prepared. Nobody said, "Huh, this is the this is the plan." We just saw this presentation by by the uh, by the division that uh, describes exactly that sixty something uh, uh, places where they were supposed to cross into Israel through the fence. Understanding that much, and we have to 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 say much of this complacency was built on the fact that we believed in defense. We believed in the ses in the system of defense. That uh, it's uh, unbreakable, although of course any such fence is breakable, and uh, especially if you try to do it simultaneously in so many places. So uh, this was a, a very problematic situation for the intelligence, and uh, we have to learn the lessons. We have to understand that uh, we have to use more and better uh, tools in order to recheck and review our uh, basic assumptions upon which we base the, the assessment, we base the conception, because we cannot avoid having conceptions, but we have to make sure that the conception is not becoming, does not become rigid, and you repeatedly check the, uh, the basic assumptions upon which it is built, it's, it is built uh, which in my mind was not the case in this, uh, this time. And another thing is that you always have to keep in your mind more than one option. And uh, be prepared for if there is an option that is in low probability, but high cost for you, you have to be prepared for that option as well. Just if you, we, we kept a little bit more power along the border, uh, we were, we could have made maybe uh, come up with better results because the option technically of doing what they did, we were aware of it. Even with this uh, thought that they're not going to do it, but being aware of the capability to do it, uh, and of the Hamas uh, zeal and uh, commitment to, to kill as many Israelis uh, as they can, uh, we should have uh, been better prepared for that. 
especially as the the uh, intelligence in, in this the early warning in this respect was uh, from a, of a totally different context than the one we had in 73 when uh, the, the problem was far far away from the Israeli population we had 200 kilometers separating us from uh, from Suez Canal and here the, the when you have a problem of uh, along the 67 borders and we repeatedly say that we have to worry about uh, uh, defensible borders when you have a border that is uh, two meters away from an enemy like Hamas, and uh, it can be broken uh, without uh, such a big uh, effort, then uh, you cannot uh, base your so, entire national security concept on early warning. So, then so that you is one of the, the, the situation was less than early warning. That yes is one of the subjects which uh, which I would like to, uh, if possible, just discuss with you also uh, uh, briefly. Um, as, as as the war now goes uh, um, goes southwards, in in the north there have been not a small amount of, of, of complaints and criticism by uh, uh, predominantly by journalists and and really uh, uh, um, the the the, the pro Palestinian the pro uh, terror organisations that 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 our attacks weren't precise enough and that there's been a, a, an extensive amount of collateral damage the the Hamas ministry or, or, of 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 welfare of health. Um, giving out all types of uh, uh, um, uh, statistics to 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 really to malign Israel um, without providing any truth. As we go forward now southwards, to what extent do you believe that we will be able to um, refine our intelli our intelligence to better target uh, um, just the terrorist infrastructure and in the Gaza Strip and and really try and move away from some of this uh, criticism of the civilian ca casualties. I know that you're uh, familiar with uh, um, an organization called the High Level Military Commanders. Um, uh, and, 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 and part of that assessment of, of how Israel deals with its wars um, uh, that, that, are, that are so close to home, um, not having that luxury of being able to say, well, we're going to carry out operations 200 kilometers or 5,000 miles away from home, but really, we're carrying them out on our doorstep when terrorists are completely embedded within the civilian infrastructure. How does the intelligence help us there to, to make our attacks more precise um, and to guide them towards the military uh, targets as opposed to uh, the civilian targets? Well, it's not going to be easy uh, because we are under pressure from the Americans to... Uh, not evacuate people from from their uh, civilian uh, areas uh, that are used by Hamas in order to uh, uh, shield them from uh, from our attacks. They are used by as human shields, and so if we are not going to evacuate them, but we'll have to shoot at the Hamas operatives that are, we are going to confront, then I'm not sure that we can minimize the number of collateral of people who are uh, hit as collateral damage. It's, uh, it's it's going to be demanding. The Americans, on the one hand, want us to avoid the use of evacuation, but on the other hand, they uh, they actually expose more uh, civilians to to harm's way. It's a uh, it's a strange situation. We shall have to uh, finish the job. We shall have to uh, at one point, once this pause is over, to resume the military operations. And once we finish with taking over the northern part of Gaza, we shall have to move to the south, and. Uh, Hamas is going to again use the people of the south as human shields, and when we fight them, I don't, I'm not sure that we can uh, really avoid the collateral damage. It's uh, the Americans uh, live in some sort of a wishful world where uh, we can hit every Hamas uh, operative uh, with a pinpointed uh, weapons. Whenever we can do that, we do that. Of course, we make a big effort to avoid collateral damage. And the high-level military group that you mentioned was uh, uh, giving us very high marks compared with other militaries around the world uh, for everything we do in order to avoid collateral damage and uh, the knock on the roof and the uh, leaflets and uh, other stuff that we use in order to the telephone calls that we give to the people in areas where we attack. Uh, we might use all of that, but uh, the best way for, for us to avoid collateral damage was to, to tell the people you know, in, in Gaza City to move south, and uh, about a million did that, and they saved their souls. 
and uh, and uh, the numbers of course the of the uh, Hamas uh, controlled Ministry of Health in Gaza are uh, doubtful and I'm not sure that to what extent they are correct but uh, nobody can but nobody has another basis of uh, information so everybody calls them in spite of the fact that everybody knows that they are uh, not necessarily uh, accurate and they might be biased and uh, and but Hamas managed through that uh, use of uh, false probably false numbers to create a, an environment an atmosphere in which the Americans are worried of uh, some uh, humanitarian disease disaster and uh, that's why they ask us to to fight with one of our hands tied behind our back uh, not that we cannot win the wars this way as well we can but it's just going to prolong the war make it more difficult and uh, and not necessarily lessen the, the number of uh, civilian casualties maybe uh, maybe on the contrary if they leave Hanunas when we operate in Hanunas if they leave Rafah when we operate in Rafah and so on and so forth they are going to be safer. And uh, the question is, to what extent can we find places that are safe for them inside the southern part of Gaza? I don't think that's such a big problem. The southern, Gaza, southern part of Gaza, unlike the northern part of Gaza, it must, it is much less populated. And uh, there are empty areas that can be turned into uh, locations where the evacuees are going to, uh, to stay until we finish the job. There are two things that can help us more than anything else. If the if the Americans focus on them, it would be the best uh, the best of all worlds. First of all, if they can convince the uh, Qataris and the Egyptians to tell Hamas to simply surrender, uh, because this is a lost war for them. And we are eventually, even if it's take if it's going to take more time and more casualties or less, we are eventually going to eliminate them from Gaza. That's uh, there's no doubt about that. So instead of making the people of Gaza suffer and uh, pay heavy prices, both humanitarian from a humanitarian point of view and from uh, saving their own lives, uh, instead of uh, having them suffer all of that, Hamas can surrender sooner. And uh, this is going to be good for the hostages. This is going to be good for the people of Gaza. This is going to be good for Hamas itself because they may stay, still save those souls them, uh, themselves. And so if the, the Americans convince uh, the Egyptians and the Qataris and the Turks and the Russians uh, to convey this message to, to Hamas, it's going to be for the better uh, of everybody. And the other thing that the, Egyptians, the, the uh, Americans can do is speak with uh, President Sisi and uh, convince him to allow these uh, Palestinians to find refuge in Gaza, in uh, Sinai, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, temporarily, I'm saying temporarily because they they are going to come back. Uh, but f- while the fighting goes on, they can find refuge over there, and this is going to be much easier for those who want to support them. Uh, so on the humanitarian, humanitarian side, so and so, you, and so forth. Yeah. So if you mention uh, uh, um, the, um, the the influence of Egypt in this discussion, I think uh, the, the, we have to point out a number of points. Firstly. Um, it would appear, and, uh, and, and so the IDF has already uh, um, said, that many of the weapons used by the October 7 uh, uh, terrorists were actually smuggled into the Gaza Strip vi- uh, um, via tunnels from Egypt. That would appear to be the case. And, and, and so on the one hand, Egypt uh, is, is, is turning a blind eye, is, 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 is not giving sufficient coverage to those tunnels, uh, um, Question mark, uh, Yossi. Secondly, um, if we were allowed to, if we were allowed the Palestinian uh, um, civilian population to flee into uh, temporarily, as you said, stressing temporarily, not uh, uh, anything that that is long term, um, into uh, the uh, the Sinai Peninsula, to what extent would we be able to control those leaving to ensure that a terrorists don't leave, and b but and and possibly even more importantly. That they don't take any of the hostages into the Sinai, in which case they would be potentially lost forever. It's not going to be easy, but uh, to come back to the second question, it's not going to be easy to uh, monitor and uh, uh, determine each person who's crossing into Gaza who is 
uh, but uh, we do have some face recognition capabilities, and uh, I'm sure that uh, this may help us know a little bit. But it's not going to be easy. The, yes, it uh, might be the case, but uh, uh, the, the first mission after uh, releasing as many hostages as we can at this point, and the most important mission is going to be eliminating Hamas in Gaza. And there's no uh, way to, to guarantee that we shall not pay any price for them. Uh, we shall pay all kinds of prices, including maybe this uh, problem, problem that you mentioned. It's, it might uh, take place. And uh, uh, I, I hope we shall be able to, to control the, the way that uh, people move to, to, uh, to Gaza. We may uh, even uh, make some uh, uh, arrangements so so that uh, those who move south to, to Egypt are going to be only women and children or whatever. But uh, we can think of all kinds of ways to, to try to minimize the chance of, uh, of them moving the hostages to, to Sinai. And I'm sure that the Egyptians are going to be there. Now, coming back to your first question about uh, the blind eye, uh, I I don't want to blame the Egyptians for uh, making the blind eye, but I don't think they uh, did an exceptional effort to prevent uh, the smuggling of weapons to uh, to Gaza, whereas Hamas did an exceptional effort to make it happen, and uh, that's why we ended up with all these weapons uh, in Gaza underneath the, the the border between Gaza and Egypt. There are huge tunnels that are being used for smuggling uh, huge amounts of uh, equipment, army, armed uh, equipment, and so on, suppose weapons. So it's a uh, it's a major problem. And uh, that's why one of the things that we, when you come back to the to the issue of the day after, I think Israel not only has to have the overall responsibility for security in Gaza, because I don't think that any other uh, group can provide us with the security we need, and we want to make sure that Gaza would not turn again into a source of threat to to Israel. Uh, but we'll we'll have to control a relatively long, uh, wide, let's mean relatively wide. Uh, strip of land between Gaza and uh, along the, the, the Egyptian border. The, border, the Philadelphia so Corridor. To, sorry? The, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Corridor. Corridor. Yeah, that's the Philadelphia Corridor. In order to make sure that uh, it's uh, uh, we, we may handle the, 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 those tunnels, just as we handled the tunnels underneath the, the fence that uh, were crossing into Israel. Uh, for offensive measures, these are smaller tunnels, but uh, here are, there are some huge tunnels that we have to block, and we have to destroy. And uh, that's why we will have to stay there, because if we leave, we shall have again the same tunnels uh, appearing and the uh, weapons are going to be smuggled into uh, into the Gaza Strip again. Even if the Egyptians make an effort, it's, uh, you know, the Egyptians are making an effort to put an end to... Uh, ISIS in the in, in Sinai and they make some progress, but uh, it's still there. And uh, so, uh, even if they make an effort, uh, it doesn't guarantee one hundred percent of success. And, uh, think, uh, we have to, to do something. Of course, the Egyptians can can do the same. They can they, they can build a, a wall just like we did. Uh, their wall is, I think, something like ten meters deep. We have a wall that is like thirty meters deep. And what we learned from the uh, tunnels we, we we were able to destroy in Gaza, in the northern part of Gaza. Some of the tunnels are even deeper than thirty meters, and uh, they go out down to to close to forty meters. Uh, so it's a uh, it's an unbelievably demanding task dealing with those uh, tunnels, and uh, we have to take it upon ourselves. We we don't we wouldn't like to rely on anybody else. The we have to do it ourselves. Are... The Egyptians, according to uh, uh, media reports in 2013, destroyed uh, um, some 1,900 uh, tunnels that crossed the border from Egypt into, uh, into into Gaza many times by pumping in raw sewage. Um, I don't think that that's something that we'll be doing uh, uh, in the near future. I I, I, I believe that the, the whole subject of of intelligence, Yossi, and and on both on the intelligence gathering side, and even more difficultly. Uh, um, on the intelligent assessment side is probably one of the the, the more complicated things um, that 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 has to be done on a, on a regular, almost daily basis to understand 
what are not only the capabilities of 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 the enemy but also their intentions and and i and i would imagine that that it's impossible to to be 100% correct every time and and really we did see it on on the 7th of october um that that sometimes even the intelligence can fail um and that's something that we will obviously have to going forward assess how we uh, um how we again change that pendulum back to the, the the situation where we are more effective in 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 our assessment and understanding of our uh, um our enemy's intentions i want to uh, um just uh, um just wrap up for today Yossi, to to note that today is a is a historic day um in in the calendar it's the 29th of november um it's the day when in 1947 the un suggested uh, the petition plan um that was then uh, rejected by by all of the Arab countries, and really what we've seen over the last 76 years, and really played out on the 7th of October, I believe, was just a continuation of that same situation. Um, the world is suggesting to the Arabs that they uh, accept a petition of what is left of Palestine, creating a third state even, um, and not the two-state solution, it's a third state solution. We had Jordan and the Jewish state, now with Jordan separate, and now just within Israel, it's the dividing that up again, and this constant rejection of Israel's right to exist. What was said 76 years ago appears to be um, still correct today from the Arab point of view. Is, it, would you agree with that assessment, Yossi? To what extent? How much is that changing from the Palestinians to the wider Abraham Accords countries um, that are possibly changing in, in, in their attitudes? Well, definitely, it's, uh, we're still there. We're still in the same place. Uh, we were there before 47, before the 29th of November in 1947. Uh, uh, actually, it started in the 20s of the previous uh, century. Uh, the big fight uh, that the Arabs uh, fought against the phrasing of the preamble to the mandate that the British government uh, got on Palestine, uh, where they were very upset with the idea that uh, this mandate will uh, be for the reconstitution of the Jewish uh, homeland in Palestine uh, or the homeland of the Jewish people in Palestine. That's uh, something that they were didn't like very much because they were arguing that uh, there was no uh, sovereignty of Jewish people in, in Palestine ever. So it can't be reconstituted. And uh, ever since then, they, are, they see that the existence of a, of a Jewish Home for the uh, in in Palestine is something that is some sort of a, a wrong done to them that cannot be remedied by anything but the the end of Israel. And that's what uh, makes the the Palestinians in Gaza fight. They don't fight for their own uh, state. They we were not in Gaza until October six. Uh, we were not there for uh, eighteen years. So it's uh, it's ridiculous to to think that they are fighting for uh, freedom and uh, and uh, to have a better peace agreement to, to force a peace upon us. Uh, they are fighting for annihilating us, and uh, this was the case that they never were never ready to accept a Jewish state on any piece of uh, soil uh, of Palestine, as they call it, Eretz Israel, from our point of view. And uh, that's why they re rejected the, the partition plan in uh, 47, just like as they rejected the partition plan of the Peel Commission in 37, and, uh, and any other option that were offered that was given to them ever since then, including the Obama Kerry uh, proposal of uh, 2014. Uh, all these offers were rejected by the Palestinians because they included the existence of a Jewish state in the territory that they uh, define as Palestine. And they want the uh, the descendants of the refugees coming back to the to these territories and taking them over. That's their plan. Uh, this is what they were fighting for. We we saw all this uh, showing up in in the uh, footage coming from this uh, attack on the seventh of October. They believed that they were there in order to recapture their land and uh, to come back to to this land that belongs to them. That's uh, that's their. Uh, way of understanding the situation. The, the fight goes on. And I hope that this time uh, we should be able to start some sort of, with the help of the international community, some sort of a 
changing the, the, the message and the re-education of uh, the Palestinians because otherwise we are going to keep fighting for, for forever. And so maybe we are still uh, going um, to, be, to be fighting for a long time. Anyway. So maybe I'll, my, my modest suggestion to the intelligence uh, uh, community should be to have big signs on the wall that uh, will always remind them that the, that the goal of the Palestinians is the destruction of Israel um, using violence and terror and death and murder um, in order to achieve their goals and that every piece of intelligence they receive and assess should be uh, um, read within that context. Um, Yossi, thank you very much uh, um, for uh, what I found to be a, a truly a, a, a amazing discussion. Um, our time has run out, um, so I will uh, um, again just say thank you, and we will see everyone again. Thank you all for joining us um, for these briefings. We will be back with you again at 4 o'clock Israel time tomorrow afternoon. Um, in the meantime, uh, uh, stay safe and uh, uh, um, look after yourselves. Have a good day, uh, um, evening, morning, wherever.